Krishna. And so out walks, you know, about 25 minutes later, the old dancing master of Tibet. And the old dancing master of Tibet is, is old and he's, he's a little broken and he's, he's kind of twisted and he, he's kind of a little bit of an incarnation of arthritis despite doing yoga right, for many, many, many years. And he's, just, he's not in great shape. He hasn't been seen in six or seven years. And he says to him, please, will you challenge him, right, this great kung fu master, and best him? And a kind of, a kind of sparkle kind of enters his eyes of the dancing master. And the kung fu master says to him, I respect you, I honor you. It took me 30 years to kill my master, who was much like you, until I found him on his ear and slayed him. Please strike me any way you will. I will not resist, for you cannot hurt me. And when you are fully tired, right then I will destroy you. And so, the dancing master with his robes begins to whirl. And he just kind of whirls, and his hand just brushes across the nostrils of the kung fu master, and something happens. His nostrils kind of open, and he, he smells fragrance, aroma of bed being baked with butter kind of down in the village, and he's just kind of... And then he dances again in a second move, and he kind of twirls around, and he kind of... His hands pass over the eyes, right, of the kung fu master, and his eyes open, and they see brilliance and color and beauty like he'd never seen, and then his foot kind of dances and spins around and lightly brushes his genitals. And then he kind of opens up to this throbbing, gorgeous desire. And then his hand brushes across his heart. And his heart opens. And they begin to dance. And they dance for three days and three nights together. A dance the likes of which had never been seen before. And all of Tibet comes to gather for this great dance of Eros, right, in the inner sanctum of the Dalai Lama. And three days are over. And the Kung Fu master, who's by now stripped off all his clothes, has been dancing naked for three days, right, collapses, right, exhausted, virtually unconscious before the Dalai Lama. And he feels next to him a small, almost inert figure. And he knows it's the dancing master. And he pulls the dancing master close to him and takes the last of his energy into himself. And the dancing master smiles, for he knows he's finally found a successor. That's the dance of Eros. That's the erotic dance of being. When we don't dance the erotic dance of being on the inside, we dance on the outside. The dances of addiction, of destruction, right, of betrayal, and of pain. What is Eros? The erotic has four primary faces. In the time we have, I want to talk to you just for a moment about one of them, mention the other three, and then come to talk about the secret of the cherubs. What is the erotic? What is the experience of eros? Ever been in a conversation with someone? And you're talking to them, and you know, somehow, 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 time doesn't pass. Right? I mentioned yesterday right, this notion of silence of presence and silence of absence. And where was that? Bob, you were with us. Right? So many, many, many years ago, right, I was on a date. You know, I was about you know, 19 years old. And my brother's uncle's cousin's gardener's accountant's sister-in-law's friend's daughter's second cousin, I think it was. <laughs> Some of them, hard to get it right. Had actually set up this date. Okay? So we meet near Lincoln Center, not far from here in New York. We look at each other. And there's a wonderful woman. It was very clear in the first 90 seconds. It was just a bad idea. There was just nothing to say. Right, we both knew it, but there was like this whole line of people who had kind of set up this whole thing. And it was like a little embarrassing to go home after 90 seconds. We spent three hours. What does your father do? What do you do? What do you like? What do you enjoy? She wanted to have dinners or concerts. Like, finally, thank God. Right? This is like where I learned the idea of praise of the Almighty. Right? It was over. Believe me, she was doing the same thing. Okay? Right? And, you know, and I need to get to the subway. She had a car. Okay, you know, I said, could you give me a ride? It was about seven minutes to the car. And a kind of silence. Right, kind of falls on the car, okay? Because there's nothing left to say. Okay, that's a silence of absence, okay? It's a silence of absence. Okay, it's a silence when words can't cover over the emptiness. Right, about seven months later, I was in a similar street corner in Manhattan. I don't, I don't live on street corners in Manhattan, but I. I sometimes the story seems to take place there. I'm not sure why. So I was on a street corner near Lincoln Center, 
and I, I, I met a woman, and we kind of vaguely knew each other. Uh, we we kind of look at each other, we say, hello, you know, are you this, are you that, are you this person? We talked there for like five hours on the street corner, and at that point I actually had a car. I mean, the five hours went by like, like literally like ten minutes. We couldn't believe the five hours went by, right? You know, she said, could I get a ride to the subway? I, I had this car, as I said, and so we get into the car, there's about seven minutes, right, to the subway, and this silence descends on the car, and it's so beautiful. It's the most beautiful silence in the world. It's a silence which is beyond words because words can't hold the depth of that reality. It's not silence of absence. It's silence of presence. Okay? So the first silence, stay with me, hold center. The first silence, right, which the silence of absence that comes after that long seven-hour interminable conversation, right, that's non-erotic conversation. You follow me? You can't pay for an erotic conversation. Right, there's no possible way to do it. No credit card works. Okay? Right? Erotic conversation means you're on the inside of the conversation. Erotic conversation means you've stepped away from exchange of information, right, and there's some flow of energy that's happening that you're both inside of that circle. When you step inside that circle, right, you're engaged in erotic conversation. When you're not in erotic conversation, what do you do? You always talk about a third person. Follow me? It's very deep. Why are you talking about a third person? Because basically you haven't succeeded in entering the inside of the circle. So you draw a false circle of pseudo-eros, placing yourself on the inside through placing someone else on the outside. Do you understand? When you're actually not on the inside of the circle, you draw a circle, place someone else on the outside, and have the illusion of being on the inside. That's called slander. That's called gossip. Right? The great addiction, according to Kabbalah, is the inability of a person who hasn't reached enlightenment, to go through one day without gossiping about someone else. What's an addiction? Right, an addiction, right, Gieta said, something you can't stop doing. How many people here have managed to go through one week without some gossip about someone else? One week. One week. One second. How many people believe in, in gossip? It's a great thing, gossip. Well, how many people have got, right, you understand the problem? You understand the gap? Right, why? Because when I'm not on the inside, when I'm not in Iraq,